So I think uh, we can uh, make the conference. Uh, it does here. Hello and uh, welcome to to all those who are here with us as we continue our 2021 lecture series in health ethics with a third seminar. Uh, my name is uh, Abdu Simon Sangor and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Pragmatic Health Ethics Research Unit based at the IRCM, Institut de Recherche Clinique de Montréal. I am uh, coordinating this series of conferences and I have the honor of acting as moderator today. Uh, previous speakers such as Marilou Rose Charret made us aware of that well-being involves taking care of uh, oneself in order to be able to open up to others and show empathy. Carol Reef taught us that well-being is fundamental to staying healthy. For this third conference, we are hosting Dr. Claudia Brown and Dr. Kevin Rodriguez, who will talk about bioethics and its engagement with race in Canada. We will thus be able to address the link between racism and human flourishing. Claudia Brown is a bioethicist with the University Health Network. She provides clinical and organizational ethics support to Toronto Western Hospital, while also actively contributing towards a partnership aimed at bridging bioethics with diversity, equity, and mediation work. Presently, her research focuses on intersectionality and healthcare ethics, with an emphasis of on, on race and gender justice in healthcare. Her work takes up a decolonial approach to inquiry and focuses on core terms such as equity, social justice, and advocacy with attention to race and race relations. Kevin Rodriguez is also a bioethicist with the University Health Network. He currently provides ethics services at Toronto Gen General Hospital and Women's College Hospital. Kevin came into biotics after working as a spiritual care provider at St. Michael Hospital and his academic background is in theological ethics. Kevin is strongly committed to and works more, most closely in areas of health equity and social justice. Before giving them uh, the, um, uh, the opportunity to, to talk to us, I, I just noticed that uh, you, the, the participant uh, can ask their question using the Q&R uh, function. And uh, I also invite the French participants to ask their question in French and uh, Professor Eric Racine will translate them. So I uh, uh, let Dr. Claudia and Dr. Kevin Rodriguez uh, speak to, to begin the, the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Eric. Th thank you for having us here. Uh, I'm just gonna get our slides up and we will get started. Um, so the caveat is, is this, uh, we tend to be, we're passionate about this subject and we, we may talk a lot. Um, if we, that, that cuts into our question and answer time, um, we, we, we will apologize up front, but we'll also say that um, maybe there'd be an opportunity to contact us with questions or uh, we could be provided with questions that we could field um, you know, uh, in the future. Um, we found it helpful to, to have those questions part of a previous talk we did to be able to reflect on this talk. Um, so some of you may have seen that we, we uh, Claudia and I gave this, uh, a talk that was similar to this at the Joint Center for Bioethics in Toronto. Um, and Simon and Eric asked if we could do something similar within the theme of, of flourishing, um, you know, to, to fit this, this series. I think it's, a, it's quite a natural fit. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that, um, you know, as we, as we go along. Um, 
But let's get started. So, um, so today we're going to be talking about the sound of silence, bioethical engagement with uh, race and uh, with race and racial injustice in Canada. So. Before we start, I just want to say, um, so these are strange terms that we're, we're, we're coming together in, in these virtual means. We're sort of all used to it. Um, but before this talk, we, we talked about how do we do a land acknowledgement when we're all coming to this in, from, from different parts of Canada, perhaps. Um, so I just want to take some time and, and, and leave some space to acknowledge um, where we are, where we're in, in, in our respective places. Hopefully you're, you're seeing beautiful weather like us. Um, it sounds like you are in Quebec. Um, we want to just acknowledge uh, the Indigenous peoples that live on this land, that have lived on this land, um, and recognize that, that, that this, uh, this space um, is informed by, by those relationships. We hope to respect and uphold those, um, and it will be fundamental in what we speak about today as well. So, so it, it, it enriches us. We just want to call some attention to that. So today, um, what we're going to talk about uh, a, a little bit is... is um, race and racial injustice in the context of, of, of Canadian bioethics. Um, we're we're going to talk a little bit about the Quebec context, uh, the intersection of race and healthcare. We'll, we'll talk about how we think that this fits with, um, with this, the, the theme of the series, Human Flourishing. Um, and, and we'll delve down a little bit further and talk about flourishing within the field of bioethics. So we're, we're going to try and start broad and narrow it down and, and really focus on the field of bioethics. Our, our closest background is in um, clinical bioethics, so we're, we're practicing healthcare ethicists, um, but we will, we will talk about the various spheres in, in which bioethics exists, so uh, the academic spheres, um, you know, as well as the clinical sphere. We'll talk about bioethical silence and, and share some reflections. So like I said, we gave this talk in November, um, and really it, it was an uncomfortable one for us. It, it's, it's, uh, I don't wanna speak for Claudia, but I, I, I don't think I'm speaking entirely out of turn to say that when we gave this talk, Claudia was one of the, was the newest member on our team at UHN. So very new in, in, into this profession. Um, certainly great experience with this topic, um, but new in the profession. I had been in this profession maybe for, for 10 years, uh, but I, I can say that I might have been part of the silence. I had not spoken about a topic like this in, in any great depth. And so we came to the topic with some apprehension um, we worried about, um, you know, how this would resonate, how it would hit. Um, when we were saying that there has been large silence within the field of bioethics, when it comes to um, when it comes to issues of, of race, and, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more, um, and 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 reflect on it a little bit more um, on, on our responses there. But let's just say that it, it it still is an uncomfortable one for us. So I, I, when Simon talked about a previous talk talking about empathy, we hope that you will hold that for us today <laughs> as we go forward. Um, we, we also have, uh, we're, we're gonna pose some critiques and updates. So we do feel that um, we could still look at silence in bioethics, even in light of, of some of the responses that we've had, even in light of the work that, that's gone on. We don't wanna say that silence means that no one is speaking about race uh, and issues of racism. That's not what we mean. We'll contextualize what we actually mean when we talk about bioethical silence. We know and acknowledge that there are people that are doing wonderful work in our field and that are informing our field. There are people that have supported us to, to be here as well. Um, so we're thankful for that. And we don't, um, we don't wanna, you know, we're not casting this net as saying that no one is doing anything. Um, but that being said, th there are some critiques that are valid and we wanna, we wanna shift there in, in hopefully a gracious way. Um, and then talk about our ideas about recommendations and a fundamental shift. So before we, we, we sort of get into it, um, I, I just wanna quickly define some of the terms that you may hear us using. Um, one of which is the idea of whiteness or, or, or white normativity. You might hear us talk about that a little bit through this presentation. Um, and, and what we really mean by that is, is we're talking about power and where power exists. So whiteness is not to critique um, white people. It's not to talk about what we feel about individuals or groups. It, it, it's, it's just another way of us situating the idea about uh, dominant power in the discourse that we're gonna be talking about today. So you'll hear that. Um, welcome for, for, for people to, to, to question uh, our usage and, and, and to speak to us about that. Um, but I just wanted to, to put out there that that's, that's what we're, we're, we're trying to do here. Um, and, and we know that this is, this is a topic that has had some political attention in, in, in Quebec specifically as well. Um, so thought it would be necessary to just define our terms. So let, let's talk about Canadian bioethics. Um, what differentiates us and, and what, is, what is our identity built on? So 
we gave this talk, uh, we were into the pandemic, um, some time had passed, uh, we had had uh, in the US, uh, uh, you know, and it, it continues, but there was some pronounced racial tension around, you know, the killing of, of George Floyd in the US that sparked a lot of conversation, uh, certainly in, in, in bioethics about um, our role in, in, in discussions uh, um, around race as it existed in healthcare and maybe even beyond and what it, what it meant to, to do advocacy work, what it meant, um, what, what the role of bioethics meant and how it's situated here. Part of what we, we started to hear in the larger discourse in Canada, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make anecdotes, but, um, but there, are, there are lots of examples that we could probably pull on, is that um, the idea that, that we have a different context than the US, and, and, and I agree with that, um, but, but the argument started to also be that you know, things, uh, things are not as bad in Canada as the US. Um, we don't have the same kinds of tensions. Uh, we don't have the same level of racism. We don't have the same history. Um, and while that was being said, I, I, I think um, you know, what we were also seeing, I'll speak to the Toronto context, but I, I, I'm, I'm certain that, you know, the similar, that a similar comparison could be made across Canada. What we were seeing was that in the heart of the pandemic, there were certain communities that were getting much more disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, both having negative consequences and, and also just simply being exposed. Um, if you looked at, at in Toronto, if you looked at the neighborhoods that were getting lit up by, by COVID, it was largely neighborhoods that, um, that had people, that, that racialized people, immigrants, black people, uh, people of color, uh, indigenous people, they were largely bearing the burden of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, whereas we didn't have the kinds of overt racial tensions that we were seeing in the U.S., we didn't have the kinds of um, protests and riot that we saw in the U.S., we were seeing still the effects of, of systemic racism, um, at least as it pertained to healthcare. And while this was going on, we, we also saw, um, you know, killings of, of Indigenous males, um, of Black males, uh, of, of, um, in Toronto there were um, quite, quite closely situated to our talk, a South Asian male that was killed during uh, a wellness check by police. Um, and so this conversation, you know, while, while certainly taking on a different tone in Canada, is not one that, that doesn't exist in Canada. Um, subsequently, there was a lot of talk, um, and there has always been this talk, so, you know, our, uh, we don't mean to suggest that our talk stimulated any of this discussion. That's not at all, I don't think we, you know, um, they need to pay me more if I have that level of inf influence, and and I, I don't, uh, and I, I don't need to be paid more. But um, what 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 I'm saying is ultimately this this convers the conversation is existing, and and um, you know th there is no cover for us in Canada, um, and we'll talk about this theme, but but I don't think racism knows borders. Um, you know what happens south of the border is not stopped simply because there is a border which we're you know now in pandemic times we're enforcing much more uh, stringently but anyways just to call attention to that um, we could give countless examples uh, of how this exists in Canada and and we will distill it down into how we see this in healthcare I'm going to pass it over to Claudia okay so so in situating Canadian bioethics, we recognize that we also have to be purposeful in situating Quebec's positionality and its unique relationship to Canada. So outside of bioethics and perhaps in general, Quebec has, has established itself with respect to its operations within Canada, but also, and I guess some would argue more importantly, its identity with respect to itself as a nation. So Quebec, has moved differently uh, legislatively from Canada on numerous issues related to healthcare, but also if we think about uh, Bill 21 on the banning of um, religious attire or symbols in specific roles or positions. Um, but we're not here to, to poke at any of this or to talk about why that is so or speculate or that sort of thing. We're, we, we simply just wanna recognize that we're giving this talk within a very specific sociocultural and political context. And so we want to acknowledge this very explicitly as it does factor into our um, analysis throughout. Um, and so in today's talk, we'll be situating our healthcare references to relatively recent healthcare atrocities um, in Quebec. And you know, al although we acknowledge Quebec has a, a unique relationship with the rest of Canada, issues of race and racism is both a national and a global issue. So 
so I guess to, to relate to what Kevin just said about racism transcending borders, um, it's this piece around, it doesn't just stop within certain um, spheres. It doesn't, it doesn't operate within strict borders and that we, we've, um, we need to think about how it is that racism is, is spoken about within certain, certain contexts, um, which, which brings me to my next point around, next slide, please, Kevin. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Which brings me to my next slide. Um, so what exactly is Quebec's relationship with systemic racism? So it's, it's a good question, right? So if we take a look at how the situation is reported in Quebec, it's clear that there are some very obvious tensions. And so, you know, Quebec City Mayor acknowledges systemic racism, says police force working towards greater diversity. Um, Quebec Human Rights Commission must recognize systemic racism. After Lego says Quebec has no racism problem, Black Quebecers disagree. Quebec leaders forced to face systemic racism in 2020. So we're seeing some themes here, and and from what what we're seeing, it's 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 a calling for the recognition of systemic racism um, up against some subtle acknowledgement of systemic racism in particular systems that one can't deny. So, for example, policing, um, to then a more blatant resistance to acknowledging its existence. And so it seems as if there are ver two very distinct conversations taking place here. One, which is amongst the leaders and the other, which is amongst those living with or those who have experienced um, systemic racism. And so for the communities that are deeply affected by systemic racism, the reality of the situation is very different. And so conversations about whether it exists or not does nothing to get at the action that is needed here. And so how does one put action to something that is not even publicly acknowledged? Um, and so in the spirit of things, there's, there's a, a common um, saying that goes, you know, only those things that are measured or counted will get action. And so that's a significant piece here because for something to get measured or for something to be counted, it has to, like, you have to know what you're talking about. So. It, it just, it begs the question, what are we doing? Next slide, please, Kevin. Right, okay. So much like in the States, the way in which our healthcare system is experienced by racialized people speaks to a shared distrust. It speaks to shared frustrations um, and just a history of being mistreated and abused. And so what's important to highlight here is the intersection of race and healthcare and how discourses of egalitarianism are dominant in these settings. And so to provide some context, discourses of egalitarianism in the hospital context paints a picture of healthcare institutions as discrimination free um, and reinforces a widespread rhetoric that gets at this notion of sameness or everyone being treated the same. And so you know, so Kevin and I coming here today as, as, as practicing healthcare ethicists, we are very much aware that this is not the case, that the color of your skin determines the type of care that you get. And so we know that there are communities that would rather stay away from seeking care than open the doors of any hospital building. And so this, this, this discourse or this, this notion of sameness or equal treatment implies that people have access to equally good care. Um, and so when some racialized people attempt to navigate the healthcare system, the way in which they physically present, so the way in which their bodies are read, the way in which, the way in which it's, it's interpreted, so one's black physicality, one's indigeneity, these are, are triggers, these are markers that, that um, trigger a differential experience in the system. And so to be frank, while egalitarian discourses in theory might be admirable for what they hope to achieve, in practice, they don't actually achieve that. So they ignore the fact that people have diverse lived experiences and therefore have differing abilities to negotiate power um, and hierarchical structures that are inherently characteristic of clinical settings. And so despite these discourses, we know that race matters in healthcare and we know that people are not treated equally. Um, and so one of the salient points that we want to, to, to highlight today is this notion of being real with the fact that people are not treated equally. And so we don't have to look very far to get at what these experiences are. Um, and so if we think about what happened to Brian Sinclair in 2008 and what killed Joyce Eshikan in, in September, we know that these are attributed to racism. 
And so Brian Sinclair in the, in the picture bottom right, um, a 45 year old indigenous, indigenous man who was ignored to death. He died waiting to be seen in the emergency room in Winnipeg's Health Sciences Center. Um, they realized that he was dead 34 hours after he arrived, 34 hours. And then we have Joyce Eshaquan on the left. Um, she was subjected to racist taunts and abuse, um, degrading and dehumanizing comments amidst cries for help during her stay at Joliet Hospital. Um, it, I think it's publicly known that Joyce live streamed her, her, the, the treatment that she was subjected to in her final moments of life. Um, and in, in referring to Joyce and, and to Brown, these are two public examples just to highlight, um, I guess what some would say the, the more insidious ways, but it doesn't always show up like this. There are other ways in which, in which racism just can be extremely debilitating within the healthcare setting. And I will, I'll get to that later on. Um, but just to come back to the way in which it shows up, if we take um, particular patient populations into mind. So if we think about the ways in which anti-Black racism shows up in healthcare, we can, we, it's immediate, like for me, at least personally, I can think about how the ways in which um, Black patients with, with sickle cell disease, how they're treated in, in emergency rooms, the ways in which they are labeled when they come in asking for, for, for help with the pain, they're labeled as drug, drug seekers, frequent flyers, um, just the, the, the types of treatment that one receives. And then, so in addition to this, there's an added worry of how one presents. So it's, it's, not, it's not just the piece around you present in the, in the hospital in pain, one has to worry ahead of time about how one dresses how one, um, you know, the types of the types of uh, that the attire that you wear or what you may not wear, um, the shoes on your feet. Um, and so it, you know, it just, what are the subtle and overt messages that this sends about how we view racialized bodies? Um, and it, it, it really highlights the assumptions that are made based on physical attributes and the ways in which people are treated differently because of how they look, how they present, being black, being indigenous, what does that mean? Um, and so I really want us to think today about how these issues are examined if, and if they are in any depth within Canadian bioethics. Um, and just think about the fact that if they are examined, it pretty much is just on the fringe without much deep analysis. Um, which then brings me to some further reflection on the system. So we need to think about such experiences within the larger context of the system. So who makes up the system? And so we're asking for people to reflect on one's own, one, one's own positionality. So, how, so thinking to yourself, well, how are you complicit in the system? And how do, how do your responses or lack thereof work to perpetuate or reproduce certain harms? So in the next couple of seconds, <laughs> I'm gonna start reading the words of uh, Dr. Pascal Bro, a family physician who serves the Manouan First Nations community in Quebec. Um, and I really encourage you to really reflect on the words that she has said here. Um, Since Joyce's death, I have been remembering dozens of conversations with patients and families at the Manouan dispensary who begged me, who negotiated not to be sent down to Joliet for fear of the care of the reception, of not being understood, of not being heard, of being denigrated to live with racism again. And I always reassured and explained. Sometimes I would simply say that I had no choice, but so many other times I would offer a justification, probably a misunderstanding. The nurse meant this, the doctor must have meant that. Don't you think the attendant was simply overwhelmed? In short, I was giving them my version, my narrative of what their story was. I told them that I know the people in Joliet, that they are my colleagues, that they are good and that they would take care of them. I think no less of them today, but I am shaken. I am shaken because I feel like someone who didn't believe the victims. Because racism, before it becomes a system, is made up of little links that become stronger than the sum of their parts. I am shaken because racism, whether individual or systemic, is perpetuated and perpetrated by someone I know, and that person looks like me. And it all started a long time ago. So Pascal's words 
here, what I've just read, really gets at the crux of, of one of the main themes that we're trying to highlight today. And, and that is, the system is me too. So if we stop and reflect on this and ask ourselves as bioethicists, um, as, as, as clinical bioethicists, as academic bioethicists, as bioethics students, um, as practicum students, um, as people who are interested in bioethics, um, how, how, how are we implicated in this? Um, let, let's, let's really just stop and, and, and take a second and really just think about um, what have we done to build trust amongst these communities, amongst indigenous communities? Um, can we confidently say that we've done anything that shows that we are listening, that shows that we are attentive to and attuned to the issues that are, that are, that are happening, that they are reporting, that they are very clearly saying this is happening? What, what are we doing to, to show that, we, that, we're, that we're hearing them? Um, and so, I, so what, one of the main things that we're hoping to drive home today is that we need to be doing this type of reflection. This is our work. This is 100% our work. So the system is me too. We are not absolved of anything on the basis of talking about the fact that we look at issues of equity and justice. Because if, we, if, we, if we're truthful to what we actually do, it's we, we're looking at things on a fringe and we need to be honest about the deep introspective work that needs to actually happen here for us to actually meaningfully engage in the type of work that's necessary to, for these communities to, to, to thrive and to flourish in a way that is, that is, that is helpful. Um, next slide please, Kevin. Okay, so to add to this question um, of, of what are we doing, if we take a look at how the system has forced communities to protect themselves, to create avenues to ensure for safety, um, it really does call into question, what exactly are we doing? Um, and so here, here, here I'm asking, how are we serving communities? Which communities are we serving and in what way are we doing justice? Are we serving any communities and which ones? So if, if we tease apart this specific um, news piece here, uh, racism common in health system says head of native women shelter of Montreal. Um, and so what she's pointing out here is that um, their, their, their organization has to escort people to the hospital. So every time, so I'm, I'll just read what, what it says. Every time we have to bring someone to the hospital, we escort them because we know that there will be racist comments towards them. We have a form because we anticipate what's going to happen. So if we're really going to fix the system, we have to not just unpack the racial events that happened, but also the reasons why persons would think that it was okay to act this way. So similarly, I, I, I wanna focus in on another event that took place here. But before, before I do that, I really wanna point out the date of this event here. So it says March 15th, 2021. Today's March 25th, so 10 days ago, okay? 10 days ago. Um, so two Quebec nurses suspended after allegedly mocking death of indigenous woman, 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 sorry. Um, and so what happened here is that um, this, 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 this woman in the clinic claimed that the nurses said they would refer to her as Joyce. And so it's, I wanna, I really wanna highlight this piece around the mocking and the taunting and the teasing and the verbal abuse. And sometimes it's not, it's not even just verbal, the abuse that happens within healthcare. And I think it's really important to talk about what exactly happens here? And so, so one, so another point to highlight then is that for some members of society, and I guess so, for we can say then for dominant culture, um, the thought of seeking care is not even a thought. For some people, it's it's I just get up and I go to the hospital. That's it. You know, like if there's an issue, I will go. For others, there is pause. It is it is extremely loaded. It's not it's not just seeking medical attention. It's knowing that there is more than that. It's knowing that you are likely to be teased, to be taunted, to be denigrated, to be dehumanized, to be ridiculed, to be chastised, to be demoralized. It is mentally preparing for all of that. And so I, I, I encourage you to really sit with what I'm saying here and to reflect on the notion of the fact that 
when one seeks care as a racialized person is not just seeking care. For some people seeking care means that there's an entire mental preparation that one has to go through. It's essentially preparing yourself for battle, physically and mentally preparing yourself for, for battle, already in a vulnerable state. And one has to remain alert as to what might be done to one's body without your consent. Um, and so really think about the teasing and the taunting and what it means for one's identity and one's dignity and one's sense of worth. So this one, this, this, this is, this is, so I want to spend some time to talk about what happened to Marie Jumuo. Um, and so like, like Joyce, Marie, Marie documented her last moments in, in, in the hospital um, while a patient at uh, Charlotte Lemoyne Hospital. Um, she was treated with uh, pen penicillin, even though she explicitly told staff that she was allergic. And so she recorded her experience um, in the video, repeatedly saying, help me, I don't want to die and leave my kids. I'm suffocating, I'm allergic to penicillin. Um, but then they inject injected me with penicillin knowing full well that I'm allergic. And so the fact that Joyce and Mireille videoed their nightmare experiences is an important one. And it's one that I wanted to just stop and really pause and just tease apart here because without this videoing, without this evidence um, piece, it's coming back to this, 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 the saying that I said earlier around what, what is not measured or what, what doesn't get counted gets no action. And so the fact that, you know, videoing and really speaking out on what's happening in the hospital as, as a sign of help it really speaks to the fact that this is this is more than acknowledging systemic racism. It, it's, it's more than just acknowledging that this exists. It's acknowledging people's humanity. It's, it's their voices, it's their realities, it's their, their experiences. And if, if collectively people are saying something is wrong with the system, we are seeing, we are hearing multiple people for years for decades, over and over and over, forms are being made to document racist language. Navigators are being instituted to help navigate the system safely. It's clear that there are that that there are flaws. That this system is flawed. It protects what it was built for. And so we have to recognize that the colonial system upon which the structures of the society was built was done so for white economic, political, and social gain at the expense of Black and Indigenous, more, more particularly Indigenous economic, political, and social disenfranchisement. If we take a look at what happened to George and his experience in the hospital system, George heard one of the noises talking about, <laughs> George heard one of the nurses talking about Joyce and, and talking about her and mocking her, laughing at her. And, and later said, um, he heard one of the nurses saying, we have one, and I quote, we have one, we have one, an Indian sleeping here in the room. We should inject him with toxic products. His problem will be solved. He's not walking anymore anyway. And after George, after this, after George heard this, he texted his, his son to come for him and they left immediately. His son described him as being afraid for his life and traumatized. And so, so this is the system that currently exists. This, this is the two-tiered system that operates on, on the premise of which community do you come from? What is the color of your skin? What Some might even argue, what is the language that you speak? There, it triggers a differential experience of the healthcare system. And one might argue that based on that triggering, you either live or you die. And that is seriously problematic. I really would like for us to really think about that. Let that resonate. And so in talking about the healthcare system and its impact on the community served, we can't talk about this in a silo. And so we also need to talk about how the systems are interrelated. So if we think about the health system, the fact that the health system is linked with the police system in some way, and the frayed relationship between police and black and indigenous groups, if we think about police brutality and the ways in which people die at the hands of the police, 
and the ongoing racial profiling and harm that's inflicted, there is a lot to be said there. And so a report from three independent researchers released last year found that systemic bias in street checks done in, found systemic bias in street checks done in Montreal. And according to that report, indigenous women were overrepresented and 11 times more likely to be stopped than police, stopped by police than white women. That, that piece, really, that piece. And so, the, so reflecting on what we're seeing on, on the slide here, so this news around, this, this piece around ex-Montreal police officer, sorry, police inspector, takes over as Quebec's Indigenous Affairs Minister. It really calls into question the larger systems in place, including the political ones. And so we ask today, um, can communities flourish with the systems that are currently in place? Can they? Can, can they? It's, it's a serious question. Can communities flourish with the systems that are currently in place? Which brings, which brings us to Joyce's principle. So Quebec has refused to adopt a set of policies called Joyce's principle, named after Joyce Echequan and developed by the Manawan First Nation Council. So the policies are aimed at ensuring equitable access to healthcare, healthcare and, and health services for indigenous people. So this document was rejected in November, 2020 by the government over references to systemic racism. So the, the, the main problem here was, was acknowledging, once again, coming back to this piece of acknowledging systemic racism. And so Quebec's minister responsible for the fight against racism had denied the existence of systemic racism in Quebec. And so while Premier uh, Francois Legault was quick to denounce the comments made by the nurses in Joliet Hospital as racist, he has maintained that, this, that systemic racism does not exist in Quebec. And so what these conversations have revealed, unfortunately, is an ignorance around systemic racism and a clear refusal to listen to and to believe the communities that are most impacted by it. It, it, it also speaks to epistemic injustice here. So who are we believing? Who, who do we prefer to listen to? Um, whose truths are we prioritizing? How many people have to die for it to be recognized? That is a serious question. Is there a numerical number that we are placing? Is there a numerical number? Is there is there a number that we're placing on um, on on life and who is worthy of living? Is 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 there a number? It really asks one to question that. And so, you know, in seeing these patterns and in identifying these injustices, we've begun to ask historically, how has the bioethics community dealt with issues of race? What has the response been throughout the years? If we think about this, this question within the Canadian context and we ask ourselves, how have we contributed to the lives of indigenous people, of black people, of people of color? What is our answer to that? So that, that this is an ongoing question that we're asking. Um, and so can we, can we honestly and truthfully really reflect and say to ourselves that we have done anything that speaks to the experiences of the hospital being unsafe? Um, of the history of being treated as other um, and, and abject. And so racism and its impact on health, racism and inequities in care, racism and access to resources, um, and most importantly, racism and access to safe care are all bioethics issues worthy of our time, our energy, and our focus. Kevin and I are arguing here today that we have a moral obligation to attend to the flourishing of the communities we serve, and we cannot pick and choose which communities those should be. We cannot do that. Systemic racism in healthcare prevents communities from flourishing and thriving. And what we're seeing right now is that people are barely surviving. Oh, it took a while to unmute there. Sorry about that. Um, so th thank you, Claudia. Uh, I I'm going to jump in and, and, and pull us uh, to look then at, at the theme of the series and, and how we think it applies to our talk. And I have to say, when, when Eric and, and Simon approached us, I was very excited um, because it, the concept of flourishing or thriving is one that I, 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 I call to mind in a lot of clinical consultation. You know, when I'm thinking about um, discharging a patient, 
uh, the question that I might ask is, are they going to a situation within which they will thrive? So if you look at that, the, 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 um, you know, there, there's, there's discourse in professionalism in ethics that looks at that as well, uh, or in, in other professions, uh, somewhat like a virtue ethics argument that, um, you know, what does it take for a profession to actualize its goals? And we'll talk about that a little bit when we, we look at the, uh, when we cast our gaze back on bioethics. But if you just even look at the origins of, of human flourishing, I'm going to butcher this because um, it's, it's been years since I've taken formal <laughs> philosophy training. But, you know, if, if we even look at, at um, you know, the origins of the idea of flourishing, um, we strip it down to even the, the Aristotelian um arguments here, uh, you know, the, the questions that we could ask is, it, are, are there common human goods that we're oriented towards that, that would constitute flourishing? Um, is there something that, that we could all agree upon? Are there norms um, that, that we could agree upon across human beings um, that are things that if we achieve those, we could say that our species or individuals within that species are, are flourishing? Um, at face, that, that, that sounds you know, pretty, pretty good. When you start to peel back, um, you know, the, the idea of flourishing and, and think about it in, in terms of what Claudia, the context that Claudia has set up. And I, I, I'd say, you know, we, we, we talked a lot about Quebec, um, but this is, again, this, there are no borders to this. We could have equally put situations that have happened in the GTA, um, you know, situations that, that we've seen in BC and Alberta, everywhere across Canada. Um, but so when, when we look at that, how does that, that, that lived experience, that, that reality factor in? Um, so what do we mean when we talk about flourishing in a healthcare context? Do we talk about flourishing as um, being of good health? Is, is that what we mean when we talk about flourishing in a healthcare context? So being well, being healthy. And when, when, we, when we ask further, what does that actually mean across different kinds of people with different experiences? There are some dangers within looking at, at the argument of, of flourishing and, and saying that there are some normative principles that we could apply to. Um, even if you were to look at, at um, what we would constitute as flourishing simply in a physi physiological way, uh, th th there are problems there. Um, does flourishing in a physiological sense mean that the, the human body has to, uh, has to work in a certain optimal capacity for someone to be physiologically thriving? So if that's the case, then, then what about people that have disabilities, right? Um, the challenge that, that, that race brings into this discourse is it, it very often is put into a category of subject, subjective lived experience or part of, um, part, part of uh, the, the products of, of society and not something um, physiological or something clinical or scientific that one can appeal to, but part of the, part of the constructs of, of a society. And um, I think uh, that that's one reason why race is often something that is tangential to conversations in healthcare, which focus you know, very often on hard science. And unless you're actively applying a lens, which we will critique bioethics for not doing so, um, you, it, it tends to be a tangential part of this. Now, the challenge as Claudia has posed is this lived experience is actually something that, is, that, that, that actually constitutes um, something very real and tangible. So if we look then, uh, so, Apologies for all the Dr. Seuss fans, but I thought that it would be good to talk about something current for, for, for this. So the, the challenge is when we look at, at um, normative concepts or more objective concepts of human goods that we strive for as being um, able to constitute flourishing uh, is, you know, how do these subjective experiences factor in? What we would argue is that those experiences need to be seen in dialogue with what we're constituting as, as our norms. because. The question at the heart of our presentation is who gets to define and enforce the norms that we see as constituting flourishing. And unless we're careful and we're discerning about those norms, uh, we could take them for granted and not see how they actually play out on the bodies of Black, Indigenous, people of color. And, and those norms are quite oppressive when we talk about colonialism. Um, I, I gave a presentation. I want to say I did this in Quebec, but I could be off a few miles, it could have been in Halifax, um, but I, I talked um, way back when, and it feels like coming full surf, surf, uh, circle, about the colonizing of, of the, the body. When people of color enter our so-called neutral spaces in hospitals, um, they're met with a jargon that doesn't actually represent how they see their bodies. Um, so I'm gonna peel back for a second and, and, and say, um, how does race fit in here? If the norms that we have set up are ones that represent the dominant culture, 
um, what does that actually do to the bodies of those that don't meet the norms? So I talked about the disability context. From an ableist standpoint, if our norms are set up um, such that a flourishing human being needs to operate at a certain capacity, what does that mean for someone that cannot achieve that because of the norm that's set up? Look at race in that, 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 that context as well. If the norms, the dominant norms are those of, of whiteness or, or, or power in that sense, necessarily, there is a swath of people that cannot meet those normative values, and then that affects the way that they will view health and well-being. So I'm going to read a, a quick co a quote, um, and this is from uh, George Yancey. He says, the corporal, the corporeal identity of my black body undergoes an onslaught as the white imaginary, the centuries of white hegemony has structured and shaped, ruminates over my dark flesh and vomits me out in a form not in accordance with how I see myself. So hence, I, I, I put this, the Dr. Seuss book, I, um, you know, I, 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 we, we had a debate on whether or not to actually include images. Maybe I had a debate with myself um, <laughs> about whether or not to include some of the images that, that now are out of, of circulation. Um, Dr. Seuss, it, it, for those that, that aren't aware, um, has recently received some, uh, somewhat of a spotlight. You know, this, this, is, this precedes um, the spotlight that, that recently happened because his publishers um, have, have stopped the circulation of some of his books that have depicted um, racist imagery, specifically looking at, at Asian people and, and black people and, and uh, almost caricatures um, and stereotypes of these people in, 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 in his imagery. So why I bring this up is if we look at art, the world of art, um, and we look at the kind of norms, the kind of things that people of color, that black, that indigenous people are subject to, it, 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 it's quite stark. We, we see that the mirror that society holds up to black indigenous people of color is one that when they look at that, that image, it is not themselves that they see, it's rather a caricature of themselves that is the product of the norms that have been enforced on them. I hope that that, uh, that makes sense, but I'm, I, I certainly would be happy to, to unpack that as we, we go forward. I'm gonna tell you one small story. Um, when the Dr. Seuss, um, uh, the, 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 sort of the, the, the uh, story was in the media at its height, um, I, I, I read a commentary, uh, commentary, you know, on a, a great source of information, Twitter. Uh, it was actually someone that had a thread and he, um, so it was a black American. He talked about his mother and he said his mother, he, he grew up in a, in a predominantly black neighborhood in the US. Um, and he said that, uh, you know, his, uh, he started it off by actually saying, I was in my teens when I realized that the Hardy Boys were not black, they were actually white. And so for those of you that haven't read that series, the Hardy Boys are, it's, you know, you might know of Nancy Drew, it's sort of the male kind of counterpart of that. They're, they're two sort of teenage detectives. Um, anyways, the, the reason he brought that up is he told a story about how his mother went to great lengths to, um, to essentially uh, look at, to, to, to interpret any book at, uh, that, that they would ever read. She would read them stories at, at night until they were quite old, um, you know, quite, quite um, in, into their teens almost. Um, she, would, she would sort of edit the books um, that, that they would read to, instead of having white characters, white names um, and white norms, she would replace them with black characters, black names, black street names, black norms, um, so that she in her way was trying to shield them from the norms that would define who they were. He didn't understand that um, at the time, but he, 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 if you look at that, if you look at, at the, the discourse around representation in media, in movies and books, that's what we're talking about. And healthcare is not divorced from that context. The idea of a healthy body is not one that represents the community's view of, uh, of the, the various communities view of what a healthy body might look like. Um, so when we when we look then at flourishing and pull it now into what does it actually mean for the field of bioethics? So this is you know presumably in the wheelhouse of Claudia. This is what we and Claudia and, and, and myself we want to talk about what this means for for our field, um, what this means for the practice of bioethics. So we could ask the question when we are talking about flourishing in bioethics. What do we mean? Do we mean, um, you know, that our field needs to look at this more and produce an output of work in an academic sense? Do we mean actually that that we need to better represent the communities that we serve in the work that we do as well? And we we think it's both. It, it, that it's it's we need to be more accountable and representative of the communities that we serve in healthcare, and we also need to be introspective around what this means 
within our profession, who we're bringing up in this profession, how we're educating them, how we're enforcing practice and, and, um, and actually how we're evaluating whether or not that practice then represents those communities. Um, quickly, I, I think we're getting on time, but I'm, I'm gonna say um, when we gave this talk, um, we, we had some responses. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on this slide, but I'll just say that we were worried and we did meet with some great response from our community. A lot of people that, that um, you know, that they reached out very positively to us. We did have some questions that, that, um, that shook us a little bit and that we wondered about. Um, so some, some thoughts about, you know, does what we were calling the silence in bioethics actually represent an opinion? Does it represent that there is no need to move on these issues because they're discussed in other realms? And we are sort of um, in a more diluted way, looking at applying frameworks and principles and not getting our hands dirty, that that's not what we're doing. That's at the work of advocates and not bioethics. Um, we also had some critiques perhaps on, on how we were looking at, at professionalism. Um, and we'll go into that in, in, in a second. But what it sort of led us to is the idea, you know, when we talked about silence, does the critique still stand? Claudia is going to talk about some of the recent discourse that, that we're seeing. Um, we had to say, you know, is this still a relevant talk? Um, we, we believe so. And we believe that maybe what we need to do is better define what we mean by silence. And again, silence doesn't mean that our academics are not producing great work. Claudia is going to speak to some of the work that we've seen. It also doesn't mean that people are not doing great work within their hospitals. It's asking a question about what a unified Canadian response to bioethics ought to look like. Is it happening? Is it happening in a way that reflects the communities? Is it happening in an open way? And if not, is it not silence? So I'll just read this quick quote. Um, Even bioethics in its critical examination of clinical practice and other biomedical issues reflects the culture of its first and most dominant practitioners, selecting which issues are most, most critical, which values should be protected and promoted, and which sort of interventions are most valid and useful, unless those in privileged positions take account of their own biases and operating assumptions, they will never be competent to take into account those of marginalized others. So we ask, um, and we may not be able to get to this slide, but we're, we ask us all, and, and this applies uh, to us all in, in bioethics, is the work that we're doing, what, 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 is, what do we hope that it will achieve? How do we hope to sustain it? How is it viewed? And how is it incorporating the voices of those that we serve? Oh, thank you, Kevin. Um, so for the, we're, we're running out of time, so I'm just mindful yeah. of that piece. But um, I, I, I want to just spend a little bit of time, and I'll be really quick about it, um, on the dominant criticism. So I won't go into depth here, but I do want to highlight the pieces around um, the way in which bioethics, to, uh, so I guess historically, so dating back to 1991, and I'm sure before that, um, has essentially danced around race, right? So, I mean, if we just look at uh, Dula's quote here, um, so noting that mainstream literature uh, rarely includes discussion of race, class, gender, without representation by every sector of society, the powerful and the powerless alike, the discipline of bioethics is missing the opportunity to be enriched by the inclusion of a broader range of perspectives. And so the others on this list um, here on this slide really do get at this piece around the fact that there is there is this there is this awareness within bioethics that we're not looking at race we're not talking about it we are I mean if we look at it we probably just look at it and then put it back down sweep it on the rug um, we whisper about it um, we debate about whether or not this is something that we should be talking about um, we debate about whether or not um, it's 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 our role. It's it's something that we should be um, taking action on, or how this might look to others, that kind of thing. Um, but it it really, really and truly, we need to stop and reflect here. Um, and so, next slide, please, Kevin. And so, in line in line with these criticisms, is this um, this new special issue coming out of uh, American Journal of Bioethics? We're seeing people grappling with these issues yet again, um, but explicitly calling out the bias that is inherent within bioethics. So the racism that has occurred over the years in terms of explicit exclusion of BIPOC voices and theorizations. Um, and I've, I've also list, um, listed some of these thought provoking but also action demanding articles that speak to the, these issues at hand. Um, and so some of the themes that are apparent based on these articles 
related to are related to bioethics and its relation to um, and proximity to whiteness and power. And so it's really these articles really tease out um, the standard on which everything is judged. That so so whiteness as the standard of everything that is judged, assessed, built around, compared, ranked. Um, so the white values, the white ideals, the white norms that are um, inflicted on people and what that means within bioethics. So how it impacts advocacy, how we even speak about advocacy. Um, and so some of them actually question what would bioethics look like if whiteness was not centered. So stop and think about that. If, if, if anti-racism was centered instead, what would bioethics look like? What would some of the terms look like? Um, when we talk about resource allocation, what would that look like? So these articles really call for racial awakening um, and racial reckoning within bioethics. And so some of these dominant criticisms that are apparent in these, in these and I'll just, I'll read one or two. Um, so Wilson uh, 2021 notes, um, the epistemology of ignorance has enabled our field to minimize through inattention, the role that racism plays in who lives and who dies and in how well one lives or dies. It has enabled serious discussion about whether calls to be explicitly anti-racist are the proper domain of bioethics, even though it is known that racism negatively impacts health. So, so just pause on that piece, even though it is known that racism negatively impacts health. Um, Mithani Cooper Boyd, they argue that bioethics needs to engage with the nuances of race with the same vigor that it has approached discussions of moral theories and biotechnologies. When reading, listening, and participating in bioethical spaces, we ought to not simply praise the fact that race has been discussed, as if doing so is an indication in and of itself of nuanced thinking about race. It's not. Um, we must instead critically examine how race is talk about, talked about in the regimes of truth. And that piece there is telling. Okay, I'm gonna jump us ahead. Um, you know, the slides that we skipped over, we, we gave answers to how we think um, this should all be solved and, and we wrapped it up very nicely. No, I'm just kidding. We don't have answers, um, but we have some, some thoughts about how to move forward. But I, I think in a nutshell, what we would say is that um, going back to the theme of flourishing, unless we have a fundamental shift um, in bioethics, and that's at all fronts, that's in academia, where one, it's wonderful that we're getting some new publications. Um, but unless we have a shift in that, unless we have a shift in how we bring in bioethicists, uh, people into our field, it, uh, whether that's academic, clinically, wherever, unless we, we um, talk about how we teach bioethics in, in different ways and incorporate uh, different voices, different ways of knowing, we serve to do just what this picture is saying. We're upholding norms that we haven't critically evaluated. We need to find a way to incorporate those experiences into redefining what those norm norms are. And only then can we say we fundamentally brought race to the table in bioethics. It needs to be a recurrent, ever-present lens that we approach everything in. And, and this is the ism that we're looking at today, racism, but you could certainly apply that to, to other isms, ableism, sexism as well. So we'll, we'll stop there. I'm sorry, we, we sort of anticipated that we might uh, run the clock so we wouldn't have to justify or give any answers to, to this, but we're just kidding. Um, but please, um, any AI, we have like two minutes or so for questions, we'll stop there. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for this interesting uh, talk. Uh, now, um, maybe I, I uh, let Eric uh, transmit the question to, to, to you. Uh, and sure. uh, if, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again so much for delivering this uh, powerful and uh, extremely important message to, uh, to us today. We have a question, the first question that was asked a couple of minutes ago. Uh, which is what is happening within the, in parentheses, desperate, and I would argue very much non-unified, close the parentheses, field of bioethics that can serve as an example of what ought to be done. And the question is asked by Kevin Hill. No, I, th yes. so I think that's, it's a good, so Kevin, just allow me to just, to just say a couple of words and then you can, you can jump in after, but I think, so I think it's a good question because it's 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 it gets at exactly what we're talking about here today. That 
there is very little being done in the field of bioethics. If we're talking specifically about Canada, there is very little being done that is actually getting at anything. And I would argue that we need to be looking at other disciplines that are trailblazing, that are actually setting the stage and learning from them and incorporating that into bioethics, incorporating that into the ways that we teach, into the ways that we are um, inflicting knowledge upon learners. Um, it, these are the types of things. So if we think about the domains outside of bioethics. If we think about critical race theory, we think about anti-oppression work, we think about anti-discriminatory frameworks. These are the types of lenses that bioethics needs to be engaging in, not on the periphery, but deeply and with meaning. That is what's needed here. That is what's needed here and that's what's missing. Over to you, Kevin. No, so I, I will echo that entirely. So what, what I'd say um, is there is work. And, and, and so we don't want to, to discount that there there is work. I think what we're poking, poking at here, uh, totally what Claudia said, is that um, there is a danger in thinking that we can do this in and of, uh, within ourselves, um, because we worry that that last slide that we we saw is that we're just going to paint over, um, you know, uh, the, the experiences of the communities we serve with with the same brush. Uh, we need to find ways for that work. So there, there's work. There's work around code of ethics that's going on. There's work around anti-racism. Um, but the question that we have is, to what extent is that work engaging our public, inclusive of the public, inclusive of different disciplines? And so uh, we, we've sort of morphed our idea of silence to say if silence doesn't incorporate those voice, voices, although we're saying something, is it not amounting to the same kind of thing? Do we get a sustainable response if we don't incorporate that? Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any other question, Eric? Sorry, I, I was muting myself. <laughs> so here's another question by Corinne Coquilla. She's asking uh, or saying uh, thank you to both of you. I was asking myself if egalitarianism in our healthcare was a solution and how to make it uh, more concrete or how to do, to do better concretely, I guess, in that respect. That, that's a, uh, it's a tough one. So how do we do better uh, in healthcare? I, so I, I think it's, it's a shift to focusing on equity. Um, and, and even a, a, as we, we do this, um, there, there is resistance. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I won't speak too long on this. I, I think, um, Claudia might want to jump in as well. Um, but I think that, that even in the work that we're doing around anti-racism, and there is work, um, the question is how do we move from actions that are, that are performative in our institutions to ones that are meaningful, and how do we meet the resistance? So what, what we've seen um, in, in just a small example is that there has been pushback to work on equity um, that has appealed to the idea of, of equality. So if we start to look at certain groups um, and put a spotlight on certain groups, is that actually leading towards equality in healthcare or is it taking away? Um, and so I think there, there will be lots of work to shift to why equity is relevant. And that has to tie into the lived experience and history of the people that are marginalized um, and have been historically marginalized by our system. So it's about, so giving more seats on the table, uh, representation uh, doesn't mean that we're preferencing, it's about giving more seats on the table so we have different voices that are incorporated. I, I, I don't know if I'm answering that question well. Claudia, if you wanna jump in, um, yeah, sure. And so I think the one thing that I would add would be around the piece of ensuring that when seats are given, that it's it's done in a meaningful way. And so moving away from tokenized ways of inclusion or um, the like a more meaningful engagement with with the issues that are that are pressing, with the voices, with the with the experiences that people have have um, have lived. It's it's really and truly working to build in those experiences in, in the way in which healthcare is run. Um, and so moving away from this notion of egalitarianism, despite the fact that we know that, that it doesn't exist. So it's, it's really just asking that piece around for equity, but, but, but in a way that um, speaks to, to truth, but whose truth is, a, is that's the piece, whose truth? Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's uh, just to fit it back to the flourishing thing is that when we're thinking about what does flourishing look like in healthcare, it is about having this sort of dialectical relationship between these subjective experiences 
And, um, you know, what we might say is uh, the objective norms of, of health, um, seeing them in dialogue. Um, and, and so you, you might see that there are then different um, ways of looking at health and, well, and well-being um, in healthcare. So e equality will look different in different contexts, I guess. And, and that's ultimately what we're talking about, I guess, when we're talking about equity. All right. You're being thanked by Corinne for, uh, for the answer, which I think uh, was exactly what she was uh, asking about. So, uh, Simon, la parole uh, maintenant à toi pour conclure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Claudia and, uh, and Kevin. Uh, this uh, talk gives us uh, the opportunity to, to reflect on uh, bioethics uh, and to do the link between bioethics, racism, and human flourishing. And uh, I think uh, we will have uh, the, the opportunity maybe another time to discuss uh, about it about uh, this topic. Uh, now, um, uh, I have the information to, to, uh, to transmit to, to the past president in, in French. Uh, alors, notre prochaine conférence, uh, attendez, je vais partager, voilà. Notre prochaine conférence, en fait, uh, our next uh, conference uh, will be uh, uh, given by uh, the by Chief of the Assembly of First Nation, Quebec Labrador, uh, Mr. Gislain Picard, uh, on 22, April 22. Donc, uh, cette conférence sera donnée en, en français. And, uh, et le, le titre de la conférence est Perspectives et défis des Premières Nations en matière d'éthique dans les soins de santé. Donc, uh, c'est une conférence qui va se tenir le 22 avril. Uh, 2021 avec uh, le chef de, de l'Assemblée des Premières Nations Québec Labrador, M. Ghislain Picard. Donc, uh, merci. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, to Claudia and Kevin, uh, for this uh, interesting talk. And thank you to the participants for, um, for their questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric, tu as, vous avez uh, des choses à ajouter? Ou? Parfait. Just a très, très grand merci. Thank you so much, Kevin and Claudia, for mm -hmm. uh, coming in, stepping in, and talking about really important, uh, critical issues for everyone, and for uh, you know um, setting the stage for further thinking and acting uh, on these issues. So thank you so much, and I, I hope you have further opportunities to deliver this message. I think it's a uh, a really important, powerful message. I hope uh, yes, others others will be uh, exposed to it, and uh, we're we're delighted to have had the opportunity to uh, make this happen on a small scale. Thank you so much for the opportunity. We really appreciate it. We do. Thanks, Eric, and thanks, Simon. Thank you.